Oh, I think a bit of both. I, I wrote it for myself because I was in isolation for a lot of this time and uh, it gave me a way of uh, occupying my time, as it were. Uh, but I also wrote it for an audience. Uh, I'd written a sim a, not a similar book, but a book of similar proportions um, a couple of years before in 2019, um, which was a, a, a group of essays, it was 25 essays uh, based on patient encounters. And um, that was quite well received. It actually got a review in The Australian. And um, it, 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 that was both for myself, but more particularly for a general medical audience. Uh, I thought that GPs who read it would relate very much to it. Um, you know, the patients that I was writing about are similar to the patients they have, I'm sure. Um, this is, of course, a bit different. It's not so clinical. Um, and I thought it would be of interest to a general audience. That's, a, that's an enormous challenge. This, um, you know, one thinks idealistically that when you're confronted with a global challenge, uh, that countries that might otherwise have disparate ideas, disparate ide ideologies, uh, different views of the world, would unite to meet this challenge. You know, there's the, the uh, idea of the, the, meteor, the meteorite about to hit Earth and uh, we could all be wiped out. So are we going to sit around and, and argue, or are we going to try and find a solution? And to some extent, this has happened, but to a very large extent, um, countries have acted individually, and even our own country has acted uh, within the state, state boundaries. We've seen a, uh, a breakdown of federation, and, and it relates very much to the, the, the desire of individuals to act in their own best interests rather than the interest of the collective. And so we've become individualistic uh, as, as a country, as a state, and the world's become individualistic. And we see this now, particularly when it comes to the vaccine uh, rollout. Countries that are poor are getting less of it. Countries that are rich are now almost fully vaccinated. Uh, the desire to share the vaccine is, um, is, is almost not there. Uh, we'll share it for a cost, but not for nothing. Um, so some of the worst and some of the best in humanity has been brought out by, by this pandemic. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm, um, I despair at the opportunities for mankind to work together um, in, in a way that, uh, that uh, enables equality to prevail. Uh, there, there has been obviously cooperation and collaboration as there always is in science. Um, you can't develop a vaccine as an individual. You have to develop a vaccine in collaboration with other, other groups, other scientists, and scientists are used to doing that. But when you bring in a commercial element into that or a political element into that, it kind of breaks down. So, um, it would take the wisdom of Solomon to try and, and look at uh, providing global solutions. Um, we only have to look at the United Nations and how it functions when it comes to dealing with various crises around the world uh, to realize that the challenge is, is enormous. I, I don't have any solution. In fact, um, looking at what's happened in Australia, I despair. Um, I, I think as the pandemic has progressed and it's gone on now well into its second year, um, there is a certain, and we've had very long lockdowns, there, there is a certain frustration that we're not providing um, an answer, um, that we don't know what the future holds. We're confronted with uncertainty and uncertainty, as I mentioned in one of the, uh, the chapters in the, one of the essays in the book, uh, leads to fear and uh, fear leads to anxiety. And anxiety is often accompanied by depression, a sense of hopelessness, of helplessness. And for people who already have uh, 
pre-morbid problems with, with mental health, just coping in, in the day to day, confronted with this um, enormous uh, and very uh, unusual experience, all of this becomes compounded. It becomes accelerated, it becomes magnified, and it's very easy to withdraw. And, um, and in fact, in most extreme cases, to think that there is no hope, and the only way out is, is, is suicide. And when, when you have loss of, loss of income, you have um, uh, the relationship, relationships are deteriorating. We're seeing more and more domestic violence. Um, we're seeing cases in young people of self-mutilation. So there, there is a, a whole plethora of mental health problems which have emerged from a sense of uncertainty. Um, and the uncertainty is not getting any, um, any easier to manage. Um, we, we started out with a snap lockdown. We were told we were going to have a snap lockdown. It would be maybe a couple of weeks. Initially, it was a week. And then it became two weeks. And two weeks has now become two months. And so we don't know what the future holds. And as human beings, we, are, we feel comfortable in being able to plan. Uh, the, there, there are events that happen uh, in our life cycle. There, there are events which, which happen um, on the basis of seasons, on the basis of religious activities, uh, festivals. All of these have now been lost. We've even lost a grand final on two occasions. So people feel absolutely um, desperate for a return to certainty. At, at a time when we don't know what's around the corner. Um, I guess GPs have always been able to, um, uh, to provide vaccination. They provide vaccination for kids going to, you know, as part of the school requirements, they provide annual flu vaccinations. But that's all done in a routine manner, and it's not done in the context of a pandemic. When we've got to do mass vac vaccination, GPs alone can't do that. They can vaccinate their own patients, but it's very hard for them to vaccinate a population. Um, and it's not as if everybody in Australia is connected with a particular GP. Uh, we've got people who have three or four GPs. They they. They use walk-in services, et cetera, et cetera. To vaccinate a whole population, you need to use a mass approach. And, and that's why you need these hubs and you need many of them and you need to take it to the people. And uh, we're experiencing this, particularly in the North and the West um, of Victoria and of course in Sydney, where you've, you've got ethnic groups uh, who have problems in um, accepting vaccination, uh, Putting the police force in there to enforce it is not necessarily the best way to do it, but um, you, you need large facilities. You, so the exhibition buildings or Jeff Shed or the MCG, they're the kind of facilities you need to mass vac vaccinate the population. I don't think GPs alone can do it. The sh the, look, the short answer to that is, uh, I don't think I've got the stamina to do this again. <laughs> having said that, having said that, I just recently wrote a piece which was published as an editorial in that Medical Republic magazine that I talk about um, called um, uh, Getting to COVID Normal. Um, what do we need to do to get to COVID normal? Uh, and I actually listed 10 points. I, I thought uh, it's, it'd be nice to try and put it in concrete terms. So. I outlined a 10 point strategy. Um, the last, I won't bore, bore you and others with the 10 points, but my, my last point was about the need to remove decision-making from politicians and, and to set up a, uh, an entity which I've called the National Center for Disease Control, which brings together 
all the experts in the field, and they're charged with the task of directing policy and practice. And they just simply get the funding from government to do whatever they see they feel is right and to do it on a national basis so that there is decision that making that's done on a national basis not on a state by state basis because at the moment and them and for a country of 25 million people uh, that's farcical uh, really it's farcical we're only one third of an average chinese province <laughs> and they have better means of controlling this than we do.